Right. Are you all sitting comfortably? Because I am. After that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. Thank you for being my mic stand. I can't hold one of those things. Well, just a few words of introduction. I'm a Geordie from Tyneside, born and bred in Newcastle on Tyne. And if I spoke in my native language, you wouldn't understand a word. So I'll try and speak in English. It's left me with a mid-Atlantic twang. So I tell people I've come from the Azores. I was evacuated in World War II, and during that time, I gave up smoking at the age of 10. <laughs> on the same day that I started, and I've never wanted one since. Left school at 16 and went to work on the farm because my ambition was to be a farmer. And I used to get up at four in the morning to milk 90 cows before breakfast. I couldn't do that now. My ambition was to be a farmer and my earthly father had arranged for me to rent a farm when I was 21. But my heavenly father got in first by a few weeks and I've spent my life teaching people the Bible. Wouldn't change places with anybody. I became a chaplain in the Royal Air Force and was promoted from flight lieutenant to squadron leader purely for keeping my nose clean for 12 months. And it's automatic. Well, now I'm 82. My boss won't let me retire, <laughs> as you can see. I did say to someone recently, it's marvelous working for the Lord because he provides for all your needs but he doesn't have a retirement scheme. <laughs> and the uh, person I was talking to said, you're entirely wrong, David. He has a wonderful retirement scheme. In fact, he said, it's out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married, we have three children. Uh, one of them is now in heaven. She died at 36 and left us a little girl of seven. Um, my son is an expert in IT and he's disgusted with me because I don't use a computer, I'm not on email, I haven't got a mobile phone and what else? I write all my books with a fountain pen, would you believe it? Over 30 books written by hand and all those since I was 65. So here we are, 82, and still chasing around the world like a headless chicken. That's enough about me. Now I want to talk about you and my boss for the rest of the time. And Don Latham has suggested I talk about the unmentionable four-letter word W-O-R-K. And so I'm going to do just that. Could I just see, as a matter of interest, how many of you are in full-time Christian service? Could I see? How many times do I have to ask that? <laughs> I'll ask you again at the end. <laughs> to most men in this country, work is a necessary evil something you have to do, which is why I suppose we get paid for it, but something that in an ideal world we wouldn't have to do. Do you think that way? Probably not. But the majority of men do think that way. And therefore they are finding themselves without intending to be in what I call the immorality of the workplace. I mean by that putting the minimum in and getting the maximum out. And that attitude to work begins and ends with pay. It explains why the national lottery can make millions when only a very few benefit. And the reason why it's so popular is precisely it could mean I need never work again. I'd have enough money not to. It also explains why people 
pilfer from the firm they work for, why people fiddle their tax accounts and their VAT accounts. The idea is put as little work in as possible and get as much money out as possible. That was the program of the trade unions when our economy was much healthier. They had this double ambition, less work, more pay. That's the immorality of the workplace and to those people work is only a necessary evil. They are working to live. At the opposite extreme are those who live to work and become workaholics. And for them, there are subtle temptations of discontent. The more successful they are, the more they want. And even when they've got enough to live on for the rest of their lives, they still want more. And to live for your work is not God's intention. That's the other extreme. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. And we work because, well, we'll come back to the reasons later. Not many people realize that unconsciously we are far more influenced by Greek philosophy and thinking than by Hebrew philosophy and thinking. If you lived in Israel today, you'd be on a six-day working week. Everybody in Israel works for six days and have one day off. We're on a five-day week, most of us, and indeed some years ago there was a plea for a four-day week. That's because most people in this country live for the weekend and find their real significance in life not in their working life, which is 60% of our waking life, but in our leisure. And it is the Greeks who taught us that. This country's education is based on Greece. Our politics are based on Greece. They invented democracy. There's not a word about democracy in the Bible, but we are a democratic country because we've been influenced by the Greeks. We are a sporting country, and football is the main religion of men in this country, but that goes back to Greece. Our public buildings are based on Greek architecture until steel and reinforced concrete were invented. Nearly every public building has the shape of a Greek temple, and even the Rolls-Royce radiator is based on the Greek temple. It has pervaded our thinking, and the Greeks lived for leisure, not for work. Their ambition was to have slaves to do their manual labor and their menial labor, so that they could be people of leisure and enjoy the theater and enjoy the cultural life of Greece. And we've inherited all that. And so we tend to live at the weekends or in the evenings. Leisure becomes life. And leisure centers have sprung up all over Britain to cater for that life away from work. Did you know that over 30% of calling in sick happens on a Monday, and the other 30% happens on a Friday, and from Tuesday to Thursday, it's about 10% for each day. So there's a lengthening of the weekend going on all around us. And people either call in sick on Monday because of the way they've spent their leisure, or they call in sick on Friday because they want to spend a longer weekend with the family. Sorry if all this sounds a bit cynical. But it means that we work because we have to, and we look forward to the leisure in which we can decide what we want to do. Whereas at work, we're told what to do by someone else. And we are not our own boss unless you're at the top of a business. Well, now that's a very quick survey of attitudes to work that I come across. When I was in the Royal Air Force, I learned a new word, skiving. And I discovered it meant appearing to be busy when you're not. And there's quite a lot of that goes on around the place. So what is 
the biblical attitude to work. And the surprising thing is that the Bible says a great deal about work. And I'm going to give you just a handful of references now. Let's begin at the beginning with the book of Genesis. That's a good place to begin. And on the first page of the Bible we find out that God is a worker and that we are made in his image and therefore we are made for work. Furthermore, God wasn't entirely preoccupied with his work and he took a day off for himself. And since we are made in his image, we are not made entirely for work. And we are made to have time off too. When Jesus came, he came to show us what God was like, among many other things. As his son, he was a chip off the old block, if I can put it that way. And therefore, he once said, my father works until now, and now I work. And if you had been put in charge of his program, knowing that he was capable of transforming this world, of saving it, would you have put him in a carpenter shop for 18 years and then allowed him freedom to, for his ministry for three now, if my mathematics are correct, 18 to 3 is 6 to 1. How strange, because that's exactly his father's pattern of life. Interesting, isn't it? But you and I would never have arranged that for the saviour of the world. We'd have had him preaching when he was still a teenager. We'd have had him out doing miracles long before his heavenly father allowed him to. So we are made in the image of God and therefore Jesus himself is our model in that. I'm worried when young people want to sponge off their relatives and head off to be missionaries as soon as they've left school. I'm in trouble with youth of the mission over that, but never mind. I believe that like Jesus, anybody who wants to be in full-time Christian work should have earned his living first and learned how to work in the real world before he's in a cushioned job. Well now, three things we can say about work from what I've said already. Number one, the duty of work. We are made for work and therefore we have an obligation to do that. It's part of our nature, or should be. Secondly, the dignity of work. And the interesting thing is, in the Bible, manual labor comes top. And menial labor even above that. But we live in a society that's Greek origin and therefore manual labor and menial labor are at the bottom of the list. And the church has been infected by this outlook because in most churches the top calling is to be a missionary. And if you're a missionary, you'll even get your photograph in the church porch. And the church will pray for you regularly. But I've been visiting missionaries around the world and many of them live a far easier life than church members at home. I've visited missionaries who are in a missionary compound with a Christian school and a Christian hospital and everything is Christian and yet some of my church members back home are the only Christian in the factory where they work or the office where they work and have a much tougher time. So I suggested to one church that we put a photograph of every member up on the board and underneath where their battle was and it seemed an extraordinary suggestion to the church. Second to missionary, of course, are pastors and evangelists. Third are doctors and nurses. Well, they're in a pretty high calling, aren't they? And so we have graded work like this. And it's not a biblical grade. In God's sight, someone who works with their hands is in a very important job. 
since the whole universe is the work of God's hands, his handiwork, working with your hands is something we were all meant to do. And many of us have desk jobs. We push pens. And therefore, to those whose job is white collar, I urge them to have a hobby or an activity in their spare time of working with their hands. Because that's what God meant us. That's why he gave us these amazing instruments at the end of our arms. So the dignity of work, the duty of work, the dignity of work. But finally, I want to talk about the delight of work. God intended our work to be our main fulfillment, our main satisfaction, our main enjoyment. Now for many, of course, their work is stifling, their work is boring, and it's anything but the main thing in their life. I remember visiting the uh, Vickers Aircraft Company in Weybridge, in Brooklyn, the old racetrack, where they were building the Viscount bombers, sorry, the Valiant bombers. And I met a man who was standing at a, a metal press and he would take a piece of aluminium, quite a small piece, put it in the press, pull a lever down, lift it up again and lift out a very complex shape in aluminium. And I said to him, where does that go in the aircraft? What does it do? He said, I don't know. I said, aren't you interested in knowing? You're playing an important part. You're making a vital component for the bomber. And you're not interested in what, what it is? No, he said. And it was quite clear that he'd never discovered that his work was the most satisfying and fulfilling part of his life. And so many do boring jobs, and some do useless jobs, and some do illegal and immoral jobs. I remember one Sunday morning, a very smartly dressed lady in a turquoise suit came walking down the aisle to an empty seat in the front because uh, it's a tradition in churches, you leave the front seats for visitors. And you grab the... <laughs> and so she marched down the aisle and everybody's eye watched this mannequin. She walked like a mannequin, go to her seat. She became a Christian very quickly and she came to me and she said, David, should a Christian do the job I have? And I thought, what on earth is the job? <laughs> and she said, I run a series of betting shops in Aldershot. And she said, it's a money spinner because the soldiers every Friday night get their money and come straight to the betting shop with it. And she said, we just rake it in. Should a Christian be doing this? And I, I didn't tell her that a Christian should or shouldn't. Not my job. I could have quoted Hezekiah 3.16, which says, thou shalt not run a betting shop. But I didn't quote that. I often do quote it because it's a very handy text. And it says anything I wanted to say. But... Um, I said, this is what you should do. Next Friday night, take Jesus into the betting shop with you. And uh, as you take the money from the soldiers, just ask him if he's enjoying it. The next Sunday she came, she said, I'm getting rid of the betting shops. And she said, I bought a tea shop. And I'm going to serve tea and coffee instead of betting slips. My job was to refer her to her boss, not to be her boss. I remember a young man coming to me and saying, David, should a Christian go to the cinema every Sunday evening? And uh, I could have said Hezekiah 316 forbids that, but I didn't. I said, um, why do you ask? Well, he said, I come to church every Sunday morning. I go to the cinema every Sunday evening. I said, whatever the film is, yes, should I? 
I said, well, take Jesus with you next Sunday evening and see how he thinks. And so next Sunday evening, he went to our local cinema and said, two tickets, please. <laughs> and, and the girl in the office said, um, is your girlfriend joining you? No. Well, there's nobody with you. Just two tickets, please. And she finally said, who's the other one for? And he said, Jesus. And she was sure she'd got a religious crank and she phoned for the manager. <laughs> and the manager came down and said, what's the problem here? Well, he wants two tickets and he wants one for Jesus. And now the manager didn't know what to say and stammered a bit and then finally said, well, if he's willing to pay, let him pay, give him two tickets. And he went in and he sat down and he said, Jesus, you sit there. And it wasn't a very good film or a very nice film anyway. And 10 minutes later he was out. Not that there's anything wrong with going to the cinema or on a Sunday in my thinking. But certainly it was a film he shouldn't have been watching. And so, again, it's my job to refer people to their boss and mine and not become their boss. Unless the boss has already said clearly something is wrong. For example, there are some jobs which are little better than professional gambling. What is gambling? Gambling must fulfill three criteria. It is gaining at somebody else's loss without, secondly, an exchange of goods or values or service of the same value. And thirdly, it's creating a risk that you didn't have before. Insurance is reducing risks. Gambling is creating a risk of losing what you had. Now those three criteria are certainly fulfilled by the National Lottery, but they're also fulfilled, I believe, by money trading in the city, where those three criteria apply as well. And it's quite clear that I cannot love my neighbor and be doing those three things. They're contrary, absolutely. Even down to raffle tickets, incidentally, it's not the size of the prize. It's those three criterion that matter. So there are some jobs that are immoral, and there are other jobs that are illegal. But if your job is useful to other people and rendering a service, then that's your calling from God. This means two other things which I want to emphasize. Number one, in the Bible, laziness is a sin. And it's always been listed among the seven deadly sins. Sloth is there alongside lust and pride and greed. But it's the one that's most ignored and the least preached on. But it's there. The book of Proverbs talks about the sluggard and recommends meditating on the life of ants. So the Bible says, go to the ant, thou sluggard. You study the ants, the way they work, and then think about yourself as one of God's more intelligent creatures. And when you come to the New Testament, it's even stronger. If any man will not work, neither shall he eat. A young man came to see me once at noon in the morning. And he sat down in our lounge, which had an open archway to the dining area, which was already set for lunch. And this boy kept me talking and kept me talking. Finally, I stood up and I said, well, thank you very much for calling. It's nice to see you. And he looked at the dining room table and he said, I was rather hoping you'd give me lunch. And I said, I'm very sorry, but the Bible forbids me to. And he said, where does it say that? And I quoted that verse from Thessalonians. If any man will not work, neither shall he eat. 
I said, I know you and I know what you're doing. You're a professional student. As soon as you finish one course, you apply for another. And you've been living on public money for nine years, I know that. I said, how long do you intend to go on like that? Oh, he said, as long as I can. Then I said, I'm sorry, I can't give you lunch. And he went off in not a very good mood. <laughs> I, I should have read how to win friends and influence people, <laughs> but I hadn't. About two months later, my doorbell rang and here he was again. He says, I've got a job now. I mm. said, you can have all the food in our house, come on in. <laughs> you see, Christians aren't softies. The Bible doesn't encourage you to be a softie as regards work, work. So laziness is a sin. Avoiding work is wrong in God's sight. But equally, another implication, unemployment is an evil and Christians should be dedicated to fighting it. Nothing destroys a man more than being useless and worthless to other people. The dole is no compensation and unemployment is something that Christians should be very much concerned about. If we are made for work, then unemployment is an evil to be fought. So I'm beginning to opening up, opening up a, a Bible to you that may be fresh, but it's amazing what it says. The second big thing it says is not about creation, but about what's called the fall. We live in a fallen world a world that's not as God intended it to be and not how it left his hand. And we've got to live with the fact that a fall has happened and that human nature has been affected. Everybody born has been affected. And what it does, it has introduced sin in the form of S-E-L-F into the equation and we have become self-centered people. And this has had profound effects on our work, on our whole life. It has meant, for example, that competition has replaced cooperation because we've become more concerned with ourselves than other people. That has affected marriage instead of marriage being a teamwork between a leader and a helper it's become a mini jungle and one of the things the bible says about the fall is that marriage was affected by giving women a desire to control her man and therefore you have competition rather than cooperation within many marriages which explains a lot of the breakdown of marriages. But at work too, work has become more competitive. Indeed, the strain under which many people work today is due simply to com competition and targets being set increasingly higher to keep up with the competition, to keep the contracts rather than lose them. But there are many other effects of the fall on work. One is that it's become much harder than it used to be and was intended to be. For Adam, who was intended to be a gardener, he had to become a farmer and face thorns and thistles. By the way, they have found the Garden of Eden. Did you know that? It's been found by the professor of Egyptology in London University. He's an amazing man and he's convinced that the history and geography of the Old Testament is accurate. But he's not a Christian, he's not a believer, he's not a Jew. But he's discovered Eden. It's a valley about 40 miles long and maybe 10 miles wide, surrounded by very high mountains, so it's enclosed. And at the foot of the valley 
is a large lake, a very large lake, about a hundred miles long, twice as long as the Dead Sea, but only about ten miles wide. And it's created a microclimate which is ideal for fruit growing. And if you go to that valley in northern Iran today, you'll find fruit trees from one end to the other. I've seen them. There is now actually a city, the fourth largest city in Iran, right in the middle of the valley. It's called Tabriz. And if ever you want to find the Garden of Eden, you look for Tabriz on your map and you'll find that valley. And it's still a perfect microclimate for growing fruit. And that's where God put Adam and said, you be a gardener, look after this for, for me. But I'm afraid later he was up against his environment. And ever since we have struggled with our environment because nature too has reflected the fall. It has meant too that a man's worth is purely in his work. And that's his identity. And so if I say to you, what are you? Are you going to tell me a butcher, a baker, candlestick maker? Because that's how the world will view you. And when you retire, the world will forget you very quickly. If you ask me what I am, I'm a child of God. That's my worth. If my worth is only in my work, then I've missed something very important in my life. So work has become harder, it's become my identity and my worth. And there are many other things I could go through to tell you that we live in a fallen world and therefore for many, perhaps for most, work has become a struggle and you have to be paid to do it or you wouldn't do it. And so we as Christians, and I'm assuming most of you are, but not all, I'm not going to make that assumption, but uh, since most of you are, we are called to redeem work and put it back where God intended it to be. And so we ask certain questions about work, how we work and why we work, are ten times more important than what we do. The trouble is I find Christians telling me I'm seeking the guidance of God as to what I should be doing. And often they've left the job they were in or they wouldn't be seeking that guidance. And I tell them God isn't really so interested in what you do as why you do it and how you do it. That's what he's really interested in. In fact, the New Testament tells a Christian, stay in the job you were in when you were converted. And I believe the guidance of God comes in this way. The Lord is my boss and it's his responsibility to tell me what to do, not mine. And unless he tells me differently, I assume, as I do with any boss, that he wants me to continue doing what I'm doing. It's his job to come and tell me, I want you to do something else this morning. It's not my job to try and read his mind. And yet guidance has become such a heavy burden for some Christians because they're trying to read his mind. And it's not easy to do that. So it's not what you're doing, but why you're doing it and how. So I'll finish my talk looking at these two questions. Why should we work? Well, the Bible gives us three, four very good reasons. Number one, you work to support yourself. It's called earning. And the Bible is quite clear that every Christian should earn their living which means taking money from those who benefit from your labor. Not living on other people. In fact, the New Testament says, make it your ambition to be dependent on nobody. Which means to earn money for yourself. And also in our day when 
retirement is coming so early and so widely to many, or at least is prolonging itself for so many, that we need to make provision for our retirement. I believe that's a Christian duty. So again, that you're not dependent on anybody else. So you work first to support yourself and your family and those less fortunate than yourself. All those three groups are laid on a Christian's responsibility. In fact, there's one verse in the New Testament that says this, he who does not provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. And it's he who does not provide. There's nothing in the Bible about the wife being the money spinner. He who does not provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. And not only that, Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, let him who stole steal no more, but rather support himself and have enough left over for those less fortunate. And giving to the poor is laid on a Christian responsibility. So that's the first overall reason for working. To support yourself, your family, and your parents maybe, and those less fortunate. Second reason in the Bible for working, the why, is to serve others. Loving your neighbor is second in the Bible to loving God. And if you are doing a useful job for other people, that is loving your neighbor. Because loving there is not just liking them. In fact, fortunately, it's not liking them at all. But loving them is to serve their needs, to do something about it. And so to love your neighbor is the second reason for going to work. In all the campaign years ago for Keep Sunday Special, do you remember that? I wrote an article for a national magazine called Keep Monday Special and suggested in that that when we go to work on Monday morning we should be shouting hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm off to love my neighbor. Most Christians keep their hallelujahs for Sunday, but I keep it for Monday morning and if I ring up anybody on Monday morning I always begin by saying hallelujah, it's Monday morning. Most of them understand what I mean, but some of them are very puzzled. <laughs> Monday morning, hallelujah. Yes, I'm off to love my neighbor. You probably love your neighbor more from Monday to Friday than you do on Saturday and Sunday. So that's the second reason, to serve others. The third reason is to glorify God, to bring him glory. And you don't do that by your speech, you do it by your life. You do it by deeds rather than words. Now, thank you so much, the head of Wessex Water, for holding my <laughs> microphone. But uh, we're not under you, but last Sunday we had a crisis. Our toilet would not stop flushing. And since we were put on a water meter a month ago by our water supplier, I was watching the pound notes go down the, the <laughs> toilet. And I knew a, a, a plumber nearby who was a Christian. And I must admit, if I know a Christian plumber, I will go to him, help him. So I invited him to come along. He came along and he worked brought another and the two plumbers worked on our toilet for about an hour and a half and came down and said it's fixed and charged me just under a hundred pounds. Then he felt he should witness to me and he gave me five texts before he left from the Bible. That night I used the toilet and it was worse than ever. So I rang him up first thing next morning, came again on the Tuesday and uh, scraped scale away and gave me a handful of white scale as much as to say that was the problem it's done now. Wednesday morning it was as bad as ever 
and finally we've had to shut off the water <laughs> just for that toilet. We've got another downstairs, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but um, there it is. And each time he gave me texts from the Bible. I nearly screamed at him by the third day, mend my toilet! <laughs> See, if you regard your work as a place of witness, you've got to be very careful you don't do it in the boss's time and you need to know that your deeds back up what you say. In fact, Jesus didn't say go to work and preach to them. He said, let them see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's the way we do our work, not cutting corners, not skiving, getting on with the job and doing a good job and doing it well. No point in speaking to anybody about your faith if you're not doing your job better than other people. That's glorifying the Lord, but finally, and I'm nearly finished, you told me nine o'clock. Got five more minutes, thank you. <laughs> we go to work to prepare for the future. We are writing our CV for the future when we go to work. I mean your real future. You see, most people are only thinking of their future until they die. That's as far as it goes. And that's not your future. That's your immediate future, but it's not your distant or ultimate future by a long way. And Jesus once called a man a fool because he was wanting to expand his business and had no other thoughts for the future than that. And so he was going to pull down his barns and build greater. And Jesus said, you're a fool. Tonight your soul will be required of you. And if you don't take death into consideration, according to Jesus, you're a fool. And if you don't take your future beyond that into consideration, you're a fool. And I meet so many people who are building up their pension, building up for their retirement, and all their thought is for the retirement, nothing more than that. I was asked to go and speak in the stock exchange in London to all the brokers, and they asked me for a title for my talk so they could publicize it. And I said, here's my title. You can't take it with you, and if you could, it would burn. <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't like that title at all, and they demanded another title. So I changed it to how to invest your money beyond the grave. And that's what I spoke to them about. And it was quite clear from their facial expressions, they'd never thought about that. They never realized that you can take money with you. Or at least you can invest it now in such a way that you'll get returns then. Surprise to people. You see, the Bible is quite clear that everybody survives death. Furthermore, it's quite clear that heaven isn't a holiday camp. And that we're not sitting in an armchair with R.I.P. embroidered on the back for eternity. Furthermore, heaven is not, according to my Bible, an everlasting Sunday morning service where every chorus is su sung 17 million times. <laughs> That's the picture that so many preachers give and I squirm when I hear it. Who is looking forward to that? <laughs> But God has a future plan for those who know him. And I divide it into two parts, the immediate future and the ultimate future. The immediate future I'm talking about is not my retirement. It's when Jesus returns to planet Earth, as he has promised to do, 
and takes over the government of the nations. He will, of course, need many people to help him when that happens. He won't do it all himself. He will give jobs to those he can trust and who've proved to be reliable enough in their job here to be given more responsibility there. He once said, well done, good and faithful servant, I'll put you in charge of ten cities. Where's Don Latham here? Right round the corner. Right round the corner. Will you be in charge of ten cities, Don? How about that? Having looked after West Wiltshire County Council. You see, he wants to give jobs. He wants reliable, trustworthy people whom he can give responsibility to then. And therefore, you are preparing for that future between Monday and Friday, whereas most Christians think they're preparing for that on Sunday. Far from it. The way you do your work now will decide what job he can give you then. I once said this, I forget where, and a man came up to me afterwards and said, David, for the first time in my life, I can relate my job to my faith. And I said, why? What's your job? He said, I'm in charge of cleaning up the rivers in England. And he said, we've got salmon in the River Thames now. And it was just like an open sewer. And he said, I never connected that up with Jesus. But he said, now you've made me realize that when he gets back, he's going to need someone to clean up the rivers of the world. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to prepare for that job now. And it had given him a purpose that he'd never had. He'd gone to church on Sunday and he'd sung hymns and done all the rest, but he didn't never connected all that up with his job. Now he could see the point of his job. The ultimate future is, of course, a brand new heaven and new earth. And he's only going to allow into that new universe those who are perfect. Now that's a bit of a tall order. And when you think about it, you think, well, gosh, that rules me out. But he's not going to let anyone into that new universe who will spoil it. And most, if not all of us, have spoiled this world for somebody. And he won't have that again. That's his intention. My wife has tremendous faith. She's ahead of me in it. But there's one thing I teach which she finds terribly difficult to believe. It brings her to the edge of doubt. And it's when I tell her that one day her husband will be perfect. <laughs> and for some reason she finds this very difficult. In fact, she said, if I based my faith on experience, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> But she said, I'll try and base it on the promise of God. Because God has promised that if we're willing and we cooperate with him, he will make us perfect. And he's determined to do that with our cooperation because he wants us that way for the new world where we won't spoil it for ourselves or him or anybody else. Well, now that's the ultimate, a new heaven and a new earth with perfect people doing a perfect job. It says we'll serve him 24 hours a day. And that will really fulfill us. And it won't be work that makes us exhausted. It'll make us healthily tired, I'm sure, but not exhausted. And I'm looking forward to that. Not only that, but he's going to give me a new body, aged 33. And when you're 82, you can't wait to be 33 again. But it's going to be a body like Jesus' body, 
which is still 33. And he's got an immortal body like we'll have, a real body that can work, that can serve him. And that's the ultimate. It's not endless worship. It never was for Adam and it was never God's intention to be for us or anybody else. Worship, yes, and time for that, yes. But we find our main fulfillment and satisfaction in the right kind of work for God. Well, now, how many of you are in full-time Christian service? Could I see? <laughs> Good, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Why I asked you that trick question was really because that's how we think. Your first response was the norm, normal one. But when you get into the Bible, you get re-educated and you begin to think God's way. And when you think God's way about work, life gets very, very different. My final word must be that all the future I've been talking about belongs to those who know Jesus Christ personally. Otherwise it's a case of no faith, no future. That's a strong word, but I'll leave that with you. And I have to add that if you don't know Jesus, it would be better at last if you'd never been born. Because you were made for God, you were made for His Son Jesus, and your work was for Him. And your work is your life. Thank you for listening.